going to dig into some source code now. And oh, I, I know. It's going to be a couple slides of, of C code up on a, on a PowerPoint presentation. I, I don't like it any more than you do. But it's going to be OK, because we've got some, some really interesting aspects of this. Uh, and before I get too far, I, want, I didn't even think to ask about this a week ago. But I just started thinking more about it. Because so I live in C all the time. But does anybody here, like, does C really freak out anybody here? OK, so some people in the applications world are really like Fortran people, and C would just terrify them. Or P Python programmers look at C and it's like, this is a barbarian language. Uh, OK, so we're going to do C uh, because this is where these libraries are implemented, and we can sort of see them. You can do these ideas in any level you want, but the examples are in C. And, um, but there's wrappers and all kinds of different ways to do this. Uh, as I said in the opening, uh, you are all coming from different institutions, doing computational fluid dynamics, other, other um, fields. Uh, you are probably not um, modeling the game of life, right? This is a 50-year-old toy example. But it is simple enough that I can explain to you in a few minutes. And we can talk about capturing the data in, in, a, in a reasonable way and, and different ways of writing it out. So uh, yeah, OK, it's a little toy. But uh, I want you to look through the, 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 the entertainment aspect of this and think about how this would apply to your, um, your grown-up application. Right. Uh, actually, I, I was looking at this, this link uh, yesterday. Uh, I always think of Game of Life as the, the screensaver that runs on, on your laptop. But it turns out that, that when this guy, Conway, did it, it was supposed to be like a play it on a board game kind of game or pencil and paper kind of game. But now we all do it in software, because these cellular automatons are useful in all kinds of different contexts. Um, so Game of Life, in case you're not familiar with it, is sort of uh, make up some silly rules about how these automatons live and die. Uh, if you have uh, no neighbors, you're lonely and you die. If you have eight neighbors, you're crowded and you die. If you have um, a few neighbors, you are happy and you make more automatons. And so uh, you can set up patterns, and, and certain um, motifs start showing up. And, and the point is, with very simple rules, you can make uh, emergent and elaborate uh, behavior come out of, uh, of these systems. Rob, last week, that was one of the examples of Rajiv. And, uh, Thanks for reminding me. I won't spend too much more time on this. Uh, Paul's reminded me that you guys have already seen this in the MPI context. So let me just get through this, and we'll talk about the I.O. parts of this. Uh, OK. So you know you've seen this in the context of how do you exchange data among the processes. But this is um, the interesting thing about, about the MPI I.O. piece of this. And I'll just take a little story time here. All right. we, we had systems. We had, we had, in the golden age of supercomputing, you had 200 different systems. And they all had different message passing libraries. Or if they had message passing at all, maybe they were shared memory or vector machines. Uh, and so you'd, you'd tune your application on one machine, and then the, the Cray would be going really fast. Then you take it over to the, the, uh, the Intel Paragon, and nothing would happen because you don't know how to use the, the, the crazy message passing thing there. So all right, Department of Energy says, this is crazy. I'm not spending $20 million on a machine that I can't use anywhere else. Uh, and so they, they, you know, they made MPI happen. The vendors got behind it. Uh, the, the labs got behind it. And, and now it was all of a sudden it was easy to send a message around. Again, you, you know this from last week. But hey, it's been a long week, so maybe you forgot it. A long, long two weeks. Uh, OK, so the same thing happened in I.O. Uh, although the story wasn't quite so, strain, so strenuous. I mean, there was POSIX I.O. everywhere. But certain file systems, certain vendors had extensions. and. Uh, the idea is, if you know how to do MPI programming, if you know how to describe your data type with, with describe your, your data model with MPI data types, if you know how to send a message to another process, if you squint a little bit, writing to a file is kind of like that. Uh, uh, and, and reading from a file is kind of like receiving a message from a, 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 another kind of process that just lives on a file system. And the analogy isn't great, but that's the idea of this. So you'll see all the same MPI concepts. You'll see data types. You'll see um, collectives. You'll see, uh, um, well, okay, you see data types and collectives. And then um, the, the knock-on benefit there is that you can take your MPI code and, and your MPI I.O. code and, and do that somewhere else. Now, in 2015, the state of parallel file systems is such that there's not a whole lot of crazy APIs. Uh, 
but instead the MPIO library, instead of providing uh, API portability, is trying to provide performance portability. Okay, so with that story out of the way, we can talk about how that uh, manifests itself in this uh, game of life example. So again, uh, you understand uh, like a row-based decomposition, and uh, in, in, in an I/O, in a parallel I/O, in any, any, any domain really, uh, how you decompose your multi-dimensional array or your tree, that's really the big challenge in how you get parallel uh, performance. And there's still no good way to automatically do that. You just have to know the right trade-off between uh, small accesses and small amounts of data and, and, and lots of parallelism versus big accesses and high efficiency. Uh, this is not a new concept, right? Um, thread, thread models have the same uh, idea, just that the, 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 the performance block size curve is very different for I.O. than it is for, for main memory or, or what would be an OpenMP kind of thing. Uh, again, I mentioned the ghost cells because when we do our, our I.O., we don't care about the ghost cells. They're important for the simulation, but we want to ignore those when we, when we checkpoint. The other funny thing about introducing a file system into a message passing data model, a message, a message passing programming model, is that all of a sudden you have what looks like a pool of distributed shared memory where you didn't have that before. And uh, I'd like to caution you against not abusing that feature, uh, although sometimes people do. Right? Don't reroute your messages through the file system. People do that, but um, that's really not the best thing. But you know, uh, when we think about a global array, uh, in the, in the, you've, seen, you've seen discussions about, about um, PCAST languages like Chapel and, uh, and, and, and uh, maybe Coray Fortran. But, I don't know. but you've seen this notion of a, a global array, uh, a, a locally, sorry, a logically global array. Uh, but it's really not global. It's, it's only an abstraction. And so uh, we're going to present pieces of that through parallel I.O. Each process has, has these big chunks, and then you're just going to, yeah, the only amount of data they need to exchange are the, the boundaries, and then, and then changes that the boundaries can propagate through to the rest of the cell, and then, um, uh, so we don't need to worry about too much more uh, as far as data exchange. Yeah, great, so this is the quick recap. You've already seen this. Now we'll, we'll st I'll slow down a little bit and talk about how an, an, AO, an I.O. API might look, because, um, so why are you into this? We already have MPIO, we have Parallel CDF, uh, we have HDF5, um, but uh, and yet we still have, have I can rattle off a dozen um, application-oriented I/O libraries, and uh, because the answer to every computer computational science problem is to have more abstraction layers, and and that's okay because uh, there's going to be some person in your science group that's good at at the low-level system software programming and. He, he or she will, will wrap it up in a way that makes sense for the, um, the scientist. We're going to be talking about defensive I.O. in the game of life. Uh, and there are some uh, approaches, there are some checkpointing approaches that just snapshot the image, kind of freeze it on disk, make it like pickling an a Python object if you're familiar with that. Or you just dump raw memory out, out to file. And that's a fine way to do it uh, in some cases. If you are never going to uh, look at this data for anything other than restart data, then okay, fine. If you're never going to restart this problem on, on a different number of processes, okay, that's fine too. But uh, it doesn't take much more effort to dump out these checkpoints in what we call a canonical fashion or a, reus a reusable fashion. So you could imagine running your application on a thousand processes, uh, time runs out or a fault happens and you restore from your checkpoint. Uh, but now uh, a month has passed and you want to run it on more processes or fewer processes. Now, um, if you have a canonical representation, then you just re-decompose the data and, and people can start off uh, however they need to start off. Uh, and that was for a long time the big motivation for these canonical um, checkpoint stuff formats. Now, uh, or even recently, I should say, not just now, but more recently, the ability to pass that checkpoint data off to your visualization buddies or your analysis teammates, that's a pretty uh, useful way to have a, a format that somebody else can look at. So either, sometimes, sometimes that, uh, that analysis or that, that studying happens uh, after the fact, 
uh, and Fitz, Phil talk a little bit uh, after the break and towards the end of the day, well, sorry, end of our, our session. There's this idea of in situ processing or computational steering where you're going to be looking at these products through the, the course of the, of the run of the application. So for all these different reasons, uh, it, may, it, it's okay, it, it motivates us trying to take a little bit of time to uh, come up with a little bit, just a little bit more uh, structure, a little bit more description of our, uh, our checkpoint data. The steps we go through on this game of life are the same steps you're going to go through on any application you work on. You have to think about what's the uh, minimum amount of data you need to restart your application. Uh, often this is going to be, not, this won't be so different from what you'd use to start your application in the first place, so that shouldn't be such a challenging um, ex exercise. And uh, this idea of storing the data such that it makes sense not just to the individual process, but it makes sense to any process, uh, sto storing it, um, any process, writing it up. Now, if you've thought about, if, you, if you're familiar with the history of file systems, uh, you can think about uh, log-structured file systems and how they're really good at, at storing writes. And there are some I.O. libraries and approaches that, that do this log-structured uh, bit. The trade-off is reading is expensive. For a long time, we thought checkpoints were write-only, pretty much. No one ever read them, rarely read them. We are starting to see it's a little bit different. Uh, maybe reading is more important than we, we thought. So uh, if approaches are log-oriented, you may want to think about uh, just how, so that's one example of how uh, the choice of your checkpoint format might impact uh, consumers of your data. Uh, the nice thing about checkpoint IO is that it's a, a period in your simulation where everyone's doing something. Where this, okay, we've gone far enough, let's everyone now uh, dump out our data, and, and when we have, as you know from your MPI day, uh, that's, a, that's a point in the computation where collective operation would make sense. Everyone's participating, everybody's writing to the same file, let's, let's tell the library what's going on so that maybe we can do some uh, client reduction, we can do some optimizations, we can do something clever uh, without the user intervening a whole lot on that regard. Since all we're doing is, is a simple checkpoint restart, we can have a pretty simple uh, API. Uh, since we're in an MPI kind of context, then initializing and finalizing makes sense. I don't think these are going to do a whole lot in this API. Uh, you may want to check about uh, whether uh, restart is even, even possible. There's, uh, in the examples that you'll see, there are um, sometimes the, the, the checkpoint, such that it is, is just displaying data to standard out. That's not a restartable format, um, but it's nice for displaying things. And uh, I guess we may be, uh, could have made the API even a little bit better. Uh, these are all collective operations. We maybe could have put an all in there, or um, some way of indicating at, at, on inspection that uh, these are collective operations. Uh, you'll see that this design choice varies even from HDF5 and, and Parallel CDF, whether you should make the collective nature of an API uh, routine explicit or documented and, and just know that people, people just know that every API call has to be made uh, collectively. You know, uh, as we get larger and larger scales, I have a little bit of time, so I'm going to take a little diversion. As we get larger and larger scales, the, the idea of collective operations uh, may be getting a little bit uh, harder to, to get away with, right? The, with a million processes, uh, having everyone do the same thing at the same time uh, might be uh, challenging. Uh, however, the good news is that most applications are not million-way parallel right now and probably won't be for a while. And so, um, there are still lots of opportunities to do these kind of collective optimizations. What we might want to do is think about ways to do these collective optimizations that don't enforce synchronization. Um, and um, I don't want to say um, non-block, you know, non-blocking or, or background progress, but some way that to, you can still tell everybody uh, what's going on, but not impose a, a lockstep kind of um, requirement, which is kind of the case with, with collectives today. Uh, we're going to show a couple different backend styles here. Uh, so the nice thing about this API, right? There's, you have no idea looking at this API on inspection how you're writing this, this checkpoint data. Uh, we're going to show a, a standard output version. We're going to show a, a raw binary version, and then we'll show a parallel net CDF version. But there's no reason why you couldn't implement this in whatever uh, storage backend you like, um, because we're, we just have a very simple. Uh, right. This, this is the nature of an abstraction layer, right? We, the application doesn't care about blocks on disk, the application cares about writing a checkpoint file. And that's the kind of uh, 
level of abstraction that, that this is appropriate for, for an application. So, okay, we'll walk through these APIs. Uh, this is, again, we're C programmers, this is gonna be a very C looking API. Uh, the most interesting part of this is this info parameter, which is the way that MPI objects tune things, uh, sorry, the way the MPI implementations tune things. And that's the one part where we've kind of let the underlying implementation bleed up. Uh, for most, most of the time, this is left, in practice, this is always left as empty or a null object, but it's a, it's a mechanism by which, uh, through, uh, through a variety of ways, uh, someone like Phil or I could say, you know what, why don't you pass this magic key through your info parameter and things will go faster. Uh, we can we'll talk a little bit more about infos later, but that's, um, they're a useful tuning parameter, but like with most tuning parameters, they get um, ignored by most application writers because it's an extra thing to worry about and you never know what the right thing is to do. And it's an area where you can spend a lot of time uh, studying the field and, and, and learning about this. And, and as an aside, there's, because no one manually does these things, there's a lot of research in how to automatically set these tuning parameters for, the, for application people. So um, we're not there yet, I still have a job, but uh, that's sort of what this, this, so this one parameter represents a lot of um, opportunity, but we can ignore it for now. The first example is not super useful, but it's kind of fun, uh, a plain ASCII dump. Uh, it's, it's further interesting because the way we have to implement this in MPI is by sending everything back to rank zero. And this is, this, even in 2015, is not an uncommon way of people to initially do their I.O. And for quite a few uh, styles of, 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 of workload patterns, that's just fine. If you have a, a small config file you need to send out to everybody, uh, read from rank zero and broadcast it, if you have if you're a molecular dynamics code and your answer is three, which I think sometimes these molecular dynamics codes come down to, uh, like a, it's just really just a small amount of value. Okay, send it back to rank zero and, and you can collect the data. Uh, this does not work so well in the climate codes where when they first went from serial net CDF to a parallel processing mode, had rank zero do all the collecting and, and, and sending of data. And uh, they didn't get very far in that approach at all. It, pretty much within the first few months it was, uh, this is, this is untenable. The rank zero can't hold enough memory. The, uh, it's a huge bottleneck. Um, but on the other hand, if you are writing a megabyte of data, just send it to rank zero. Right? This is sort of the trade-off. Uh, you don't need to talk to Phil or I until IO is like 20% of your problem. Uh, I don't want anybody to prematurely optimize code. Um, you're, you, will ha you will need help soon enough, but uh, you don't need to worry about it until it hits that point. So now we're going to we're going to walk through the code. I'll talk about some of the highlights of what makes this uh, interesting and, and how you might. Um, it's it's a, it's a it's, it's, it's the the foundation yeah it is the foundation layer upon which the further the other examples will uh, will build on and I'll I'll, I'll demonstrate uh, I'll show you where the um, where can, code can be improved for the uh, the other layers. All right, so this is really just a, a wall of text. Um, hopefully you've checked out the the GitLab repository and you can just look at this on your laptop. Um, but if you just want to look at it. I think the important things are there's there's no notion of a, a communicator here. Um, there's a global communicator kept here, uh, which gets assigned somewhere else. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, here's an interesting one. We again, sorry. Uh, you saw a lot of this stuff last week with the MPI tutorial. We can create data types with with API functions. Just pass those back without knowing what's going on. Uh, we can display things and then, and then a little delay here in a portable fashion so that people can actually look at this output and, and see the little life doodads evolve. Okay. Um, if you're writing a little IO library, make sure you dupe the communicator. This, um, I think this is a lesson you heard last week too, but uh, again, story time. In parallel in SVF, we did not dupe the communicator for about a decade until a student came by and said, when I do this all gather, I get a weird result. If I do two out gathers, it's fine, what's going on? And it was really puzzling for about a day and a half, and then when we duped the, the communicator, the student had no problem anymore. So uh, even um, grown up IO library writers make mistakes, uh, learn from us. Here we are finally at the IO part. And the checkpoint is capturing all the information, you know, where does it, which file do we write to, uh, how, what does our matrix look like, how many, 
you know, sorry, here's the data of our matrix and then a description, right? If C is pretty low level, you can't really describe multidimensional arrays. So we have to have both a, a big hunk of data and then a description of how it's set up. There's a little bit of, of computation here on, on where we are in the global state of things. Uh, this is kind of an idiom you'll see a lot in MPI programs. And then finally, uh, right, remember, this is, the I, this is the IO part. This is where we would actually do um, writing to disk. Here's the point, right? We have all the data we've, we have on the previous slide, uh, find out where we are globally and what we're supposed to do, and then we would then do IO here. Well, in this case, the IO is sent back to rank zero, and, and rank zero um, collects all the data and then sends it out. To, uh, to the output, to the, the, the screen. And, and you can try this out on Mira and you can see it actually doing stuff. So it keeps on going. Uh, this is the receive, this is the, match, this is the this receive here matches the receive we saw on the previous slide. Um, and you're just going through row by row, dumping out all the data. Uh, not necessarily uh, in, um, I, yeah, so rank zero writes the first row going from the top down. And, uh, or maybe depending on how many, how you decompose, decompose the rows among processes, maybe rank zero writes out five rows. Um, and then a small sleep, just so you can see what's going on. You, if you were trying to, if you were a game of life study, or you would, of course, take that sleep away because you would just want to see how does my initial con condition happen for 10,000 generations or something like that. But uh, for humans looking at a display, a little sleep to give it an illusion of movement. So we're going to, uh, so okay, that's great. This is, a, this is a simple version using basic, uh, we, haven't done, we haven't done any MPIO yet, and I've been talking for uh, 20 minutes. But here we go. The I/O part of it, and again, uh, if you were uh, thinking about how you would send this data to another process, the discussions are all the same. Uh, except in this case, instead of sending to a process, we're going to dump it to a file. Uh, every process, in this case, we've got uh, four rows and two ghost two ghost rows. Uh, we want to describe um, we want to describe the memory. And now remember, in C, we have and there's no idea of there's no idea of multidimensional memory. It's just a linear address space. So, um, if we want to describe um, describe this piece of memory, uh, that's kind of, it looks like a vector. Right? You're walking through in um, with a stride of some kind and and going row by row as you're out the data. So let's, see, let's show the code here. I'll talk more about what's going on here in the IO in the MPI IO version. Again, the API totally the same. Uh, as we saw in the standard output version, uh, sorry, I got ahead of myself here. This is a new version where we're creating an MPI data type. And what we're gonna do is uh, pass this back into the caller. Caller will then make a file view out of that. And, and, and um, you can use these, sorry, let me, let me say this differently. You can use these MPI data types two different ways. One, to describe application memory. In this case, we have a little bit of structure. We're emitting ghost cells. And another way to do it is to describe how it's laid out in disk. Now, in our case, there's not much non, there's not much structure to the file format on disk. It's just going to be dumping out uh, arrays, uh, rows that is, uh, in, in the, the way that's um, most natural to the application. But if you had uh, more elaborate scientific data, or if you're trying to write out um, different patterns, uh, you would use these MPI data types to set file views. And uh, we thought when, we, when MPI was MPIO was de designed that applications would create file views and then use those over and over again. In practice, that hasn't turned out that way. And instead, it's a sort of a, a pain in the neck extra step to describe non-contiguous file access. If we were to do it again to, in, this, in a modern era, we would couple the uh, file description with the memory description in one I.O. call. But uh, as you'll see, we don't do that. Instead, we describe the data. We have a number of, of uh, rows, and we're going to stride um, the type signature for, victor, for a vector is uh, the number of blocks in the vector, how big each block, how big each block of that is. In this case, the number of columns in our in our game of life, and then what the stride is. In the stride, we're going to skip over our ghost uh, elements. And uh, the type here is uh, an MPI int type. Uh, there's a whole bunch of built-in MPI types, which are often adequate for many uses. Uh, but we're going to, um, that's our base type. We're going to derive a type into, into here. Again, this is, if you, do, if you did message passing uh, with um, sends and receives, so you do the same thing. MPI address is a funny function because uh, 
why would you just not take the address of it, right? Uh, and in many cases, that's all the MPI address does is take a, take a pointer, a C, a C address style. But uh, two reasons we have MPI address. Uh, one, Fortran doesn't have, Fortran 77 doesn't have the notion of pointers. And, and two, systems used to have segmented memory. Um, and maybe the segments of memory will come back again. Uh, but uh, we keep this around for uh, historical and, and future proofing our, our code. So uh, let the library tell us what the address is, just in case there's something weird about our memory model. Uh, yeah, we talked about, you talked about this last, last week, I'm sure. All right. Now let's make this IPI parallel. We have, we have described the data types for sending and receiving. We've described. Uh, how we need to do things. Uh, let's get setting in here. Um, I've touched on most of this, but um, one of the one of the recurring themes in a talk like this is sort of uh, we present you a bunch of details in kind of the hopes that you will uh, freak out a little bit and, and not do any of this stuff uh, and and let the libraries do it for you. Uh, a lot of times we'll see okay. Computational scientists didn't get where they are because they're stupid, right? They're all very clever, very driven folks. And if they have a problem with I.O. on, on a, a Luster system on, on Cray, they're going to figure out what the problem is and write a library to get around that. And then uh, when they port to a blue gene system, we'll find that their optimizations don't do anything uh, or, or counterproductive. Uh, and, and then we have to tell them, well, what you did was good. You reduced your number of clients to a number of aggregators. Uh, it's just that the IO library on BlueGene does that for you in a way that picks the right aggregators that are fastest. And you picked the exact wrong aggregators, and that's why you get bad performance. And that's, that's an easy example to pick on somebody. But you know, when you are trying to do a science run, your goal is to get science done, not, not to understand the global state of parallel IO. That's what Phil and I are for. So. Uh, the MPIO, the MPIO library is maybe a little bit complicated. It has a lot of different features about data types and, and, and file views and, and all these things. It's encapsulating a lot of sophisticated optimizations. And then, um, so on the one hand, I want you to use MPIO because it's going to do data sieving and aggregation. It's going to do all these other clever things. On the other hand, I want you to, to not use MPIO. I want you to use something on top of MPIO. So um, all the optimizations that happen in this discussion are implemented in Parallel CDF and HDF5 in um, other IO libraries that are built on top of, MP of, of, these, of this uh, interface. And if, um, if, you if you were a UPC programmer, I don't think there are too many these days, and you were doing UPC IO, you might uh, want an IO library to handle that for you uh, as well. Uh, we, we bug the Chapel guys a lot about this too. Uh, they have. It's on their list of things to worry about. What's, what's the data management model for a chapel? And you have when you have global arrays, um, what does IO look like in that sense? What is what's what's collective IO or data data type IO look like? And um, that's an area where things are still a little bit uh, not quite as mature. But um, as chapel users and UPC users and other uh, PGAS language users start doing IO, they're going to be having the same uh, challenges that, that message passing users had uh, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. So. Uh, we work with them, and they, they know about the problems. We'll, we'll figure it all out. Um, but you don't have to figure it out as computational scientists. I talked a little bit about the parallel, the, the orthogonality, right? If you know how to send messages back and forth between uh, two MPI processes, then you basically know how MPI IO works. You describe your data, you pack it up, and, and send it off. And in this case, you write it to a file. Um, the uh, the non-blocking operations in MPI are, are OK, um, but uh, a lot of people see them and think, oh, great, uh, non-blocking I.O. means I get I.O. for free. And that's not really where things are today. Uh, I would focus on collective I.O. first and then worry about the non-blocking I.O. and bug people like me about, about why it's not working. OK, so recapping, collective I.O., you have the name of the game in collective I.O. is to do an, an I.O. transformation. And the easiest way to transform data is to turn tiny little requests for a bunch of cl clients into big contiguous requests. Unless you're on Luster, in which case you want to stride your data across each OST in a way that only touches one OST. And, and don't worry about that. Because again, the I.O. library will do it for you. But 
you want to transform the data in some way. This transformation is happening. And the easiest transformation is collect the requests, make them big, send them off to storage. Uh, the other point here is, again, you have all of these clients, you know, 100,000 clients doing I.O. Uh, doing I.O. does not mean write to disk. Doing I.O. just means describe to the storage system what's going to happen. Uh, um, well, in this case, describe to the MPI I.O. library what's going to happen. And the optimizations can take place. We're showing these because they lay the foundation for other I.O. libraries. So if you understand this, then um, you'll know what, what, what a hyperslab is doing or what the um, array descriptions in Parallelnet CDF are trying to, con to convey. Uh, Phil mentioned about um, how headers can sometimes dis distort data a little bit. Um, maybe if we were uh, more clever, we would make a footer on the file instead of a header on the file. But um, the nice thing is if you're doing collective I.O., then this idea of block boundary massaging happens, again, automatically. Files do not have array structures. They just start at 0, and they go on until you run out of space. Uh, we will then pour into this file a little bit of data. Uh, how many uh, rows and columns are we going to have, what iteration we're on, and then the data, uh, which is going to be um, chunked up, logically chunked up by process. And as it turns out, uh, a row-oriented decomposition in C is nice and contiguous. If for some reason you're going to do a, a column-oriented decomposition, right, then you would have a much more uh, aggressive uh, file pattern. I'm, and there are certainly classes of, of applications where um, you don't really want to worry about how, what is the best way to write this data. I just want to, you know, my, my science, my automatic differentiation or, or finite element analysis tells me I need to go um, in a diagonal across this array, you know, this, this matrix. Uh, and a diagonal on a matrix is a pretty tough file um, data access pattern because you have to find one, and then two, and then four, and then two, one, two, three. Oh, sorry. The lower diagonal, would, the lower diagonal of, a, of a matrix would be kind of a, a messy access pattern. But again, if you, fee, you feed that to MPIO, you don't need to worry about it. If you remember the image from before, there were ghost cells to, to sort of reduce the amount of communication needed. We're not going to save ghost cells. They are um, extra ancillary data that is not important for checkpointing. So let's go through the code. All right, so uh, if you've done Low-level POSIX I.O., a lot of these flags look familiar. Um, we put an E in create, so I, I put an A in create, so I guess that's uh, score one for usability, I, I guess. But uh, the idea here, uh, with a checkpoint, so we're going to pass the, the write-only flag. That might let certain caching happen or, or not happen. That makes sense. Um, MPI mode unique open is a rarely used flag that is supposed to tell the file system uh, no one else will touch this file, just me. So go ahead and, and turn off your locking and caching, and, and no one does that. So um, it's supposed to be more helpful than it actually is. And then uh, finally, uh, a collective file open call. Uh, here where we, uh, okay, so uh, this communicator, um, oh, remember this communicator was a, a global variable stored away in, in an earlier slide. Um, we're going to create a, a per checkpoint, sorry, a per iteration checkpoint file, which is a fine thing to do. Um, one of the examples, one of the exercises is, is, is to think about how you might store this data where all the checkpoint files are kept in one bigger file. Uh, oh, an important thing here that many people, including me, sometimes don't do, uh, this code is checking error codes. Uh, the Error handling here is fairly primitive. There are ways of getting, you can process the error code back from file open and, and actually find out what happened, what went wrong. But in this case, we're just saying something happened, we gave up. The, uh, okay, we, we have split up the, the we, have, we have bifurcated the type processing a little bit. Rank zero, uh, sorry, the non-ranks are doing a little bit of um, offset because of the, uh, that little header we put on the front. And then, okay, so. Go back, we have, this, this is the checkpoint, and the, the application has done some simulation, it's gonna checkpoint the data. We've passed uh, the matrix data into this application, so we open the file collectively, and then we write it collectively with this, with the at all, uh, sorry, underscore all in MPI means it's collective, MPIO means it's collective. MPI bottom is uh, a way of saying, I have used absolute addresses in my type construction, so um, don't worry about putting this relative to anything, take absolute addresses. And then uh, 
and then this is where all the magic happens that Phil talked about earlier, all those data transformations and, uh, and, and, and things go fast. Now restarting is a little bit more complicated because uh, remember we're trying to produce a checkpoint file that can be read by, restarted by any number of processors. So we, we don't know anything about, we're gonna pretend like we don't know anything about this data other than it's got three integers describing the file plus some, some data. So we, uh, we, we, construct, we construct the file name, we open the file and, and read it. Uh, we are reading collectively. Uh, this is interesting because in MPI IO, we've, we've defined semantics such that it's uh, friendly to, the, to parallel file systems, but maybe a little bit awkward for, for, for uh, application writers. If we all write to the same spot in a file, that's illegal or, or what we call undefined semantics. And it would be possible that the MPI library, MPI-IO library would write gibberish to your file. Uh, often it just writes blocks from one process. Read, a read is a different story. And we've asked uh, the MPI-IO library, uh, read this data, these three, <coughs> these three integers, three, you know, here's a buffer, fill this buffer with three integers. And everyone is passing the same offset, the same everything. So uh, it's possible that the MPI library will uh, take that and implement it as a, as a read and broadcast, or it's effectively a read and broadcast, but it's doing that for you. Um, fun fact, if you try this on BlueGene at 16,000 processes, you run out, you'll run out of memory, sorry. Uh, we never really found a good fix for that, but uh, there's, we're working on it. We're just double checking that the error code is the same, make sure everything, everyone's looking at uh, uh, the same errors and that everything, that everyone's in agreement, right? No one got an error, no one got different number of sizes uh, because again, we're assuming nothing about this file. And then we do a collective read. Uh, again, we've constructed the data type, everyone reads their particular memory um, region into file and now they can, can, they can go on. We're using MPI bottom here uh, because we're dealing with absolute addresses. Uh, we create this struct type uh, because we have a couple different, um, oh, I guess we could have used some, we could use some, we didn't need to use a struct type. I guess we could use uh, index type, but that's okay. Uh, so in order to kind of wrap up the MPI version, there's a, we're just trying, we're trying to take all the MPI features and, and distill it down to the few routines that this, this game of life example or, or um, whatever your, your science application is actually needs. Um, and so uh, it, may be, it may be simple enough that just doing it yourself is, is, is fine. Um, you probably would need a little more, um, sorry, you may not, today you, you may not need the uh, full power of a data model library like Parallel CDF or HDF5, but uh, Code lives longer than you think it will, and so uh, you may find yourself a few years down the road wishing you had just done the uh, the parallel CDF way or HDF5 way before. Um, if you don't have coordination, if you, you know, if collective I/O doesn't make sense, you could still use some of the MPI routines. There's independent routines; uh, they are more closely. They don't really do much more. There are some optimizations in that path. Uh, we focus mostly on collective I/O because of how it's, how it's, of how it's benefited uh, blue gene type applications so much, in particular, uh, or any of these large scale applications. Uh, you know, even if you aren't benefiting from data type I/O, uh, the benefits from I/O aggregation and, and consolidating I/O down to a small number of processes means that even uh, in simple benchmarks where everyone's writing out big contiguous chunks already, uh, at these scales, the storage is so out of whack with respect to the CPU and, and network performance that, that these kind of things uh, still benefit. So let's talk about taking this game of life example and, and throwing it into, into Parallel Net CDF. Uh, I'm to, remind, to remind everybody where we are in the software stack, to remind everybody where we are in the stack, this, we're, ta we're talking now more about a, a library that's closer to the application. Uh, whereas MPIO has to be uh, the, the the glue that all people, all, people may, all people might want to do anything with. When we talk about a data model library, we're able to take that um, fairly simple file model and somewhat 
uh, uh, elaborate API and, and just distill it down to, to um, well, sorry, build it in some ways. You know, Parallel NetCDF introduces a bunch of new features, uh, but make it simpler in other ways uh, because it's more like what applications folks are expecting. And so I'm going to talk about Parallel Net CDF because it's, a, it's what I've worked on at Argonne with, in collaboration with Northwestern. But we also have a big chunk of time after lunch where Scott's going to talk about HDF5. And uh, it's, it's fun to think of them as competing libraries, but uh, really it's, it's, there's not really a lot of competition going on. They're just, they do different things in different ways. They've been useful to have um, some different uh, design choices manifest themselves. And uh, sometimes the decision isn't so much performance as it is what's going on in your, in your ecosystem. The climate people have years of NetCDF data. And so having a library like Parallel NetCDF that can access that data uh, in, in parallel means that that's the kind of library they're going to use, no matter how good or bad it performs. The decision's been locked in, in based on the ecosystem. And in other domains, HDF5 is where you go. And they both do the same thing, so it's really uh, using either one of them, you win, uh, because they're, they're taking the idea of um, a self-describing portable file format and packaging that, that up in an, an, AO, in an IO API that uh, can take some getting used to, but uh, distills all these features down for you. Oh, and the nice thing about these file formats is that not only do you write the raw data, but you can annotate them with uh, descriptions of the kind of experiment you're doing, the, the machine you're on, and other things that'll help uh, future you or future collaborators uh, realize what this, this, this blob of data is, is, is doing. But in parallel NetCDF, we're talking about a, a, a way of imposing on this linear stream of bytes, right? That's how we think about files. It goes from zero to whatever in, in a long file. And then adding structure to that, maybe a, a three-dimensional chunk of the atmosphere or a two-dimensional patch of the, uh, of the ground. And this, is, this on the, the, the left is how the application thinks about it. And on the right is how the NetCDF file would describe that data. There would be uh, a, a variable has a name, a human readable name, not just offset 2045, but call it temp. It has a type. It has dimensions. Uh, there is a, a unit here, too, right? I mean, we, we all remember the sad story of the, uh, the Mars, exp Mars probe that blew up because they got the units wrong, right? Uh, or crash landed because they got the units wrong. But here we can annotate those units to make sure that when we do talk about uh, uh, I don't know, uh, temperature on the surface. We're talking about Kelvins, not, uh, not degrees Celsius. Uh, oh, and then the only piece here that's kind of implementation specific is this, this start offset. That's, that's where we tell the, the library in the header is saying, go to this part of the file, you'll find the raw data you, you're looking for. The nice thing about parallel CDF is that the data lives in these big chunky regions. Uh, all the temperature data goes here, then all the pressure goes here, and, and so on and so forth. There's a small exception with record variables, but I'll talk about that later. Uh, so uh, there is this idea of a, a net CDF file format, and then there are several different ways of reading uh, those file formats. Uh, the serial way from, from UCAR is the, the tried and true, uh, been around since 1992 method. Uh, it is. Uh, it, it described, it, it, it's the first one to introduce this idea of multidimensional arrays, uh, some descriptions, annotations, uh, both on the variables and the dimensions and the file itself. Parallel at CDF, we started working that back in 2004, um, and it's introducing collect, oh, sorry, collective and parallel I.O. to the same file format. So the big transition selling point for parallel at CDF, parallel at CDF was, okay, you have your data set already, we can work with that. We can read it. We can produce a data set that your serial processing tools can understand. Um, all you need to do is use a different API. We, we deliberately changed the API so that no one would be surprised about the parallelism. And that also let us do some other research things. Uh, and, uh, but it's a pretty thin layer on top of MPI IO, right? As you can imagine, uh, an array that, uh, sorry, an API that describes multidimensional arrays is a pretty good fit for. Uh, you know, creating MPI data types and, and writing that off. So um, the nice thing about Parallel Net CDF is that it's a pretty simple library, and uh, that means you can't do certain things, but it also means the things you can do are pretty much a straight path down to MPI I.O. So again, 
you know how this works out, but um, we're just going to, uh, yeah, we're not going to worry about, the, a lot of the, the mental model of how we write this file is a lot like the MPI IO version. There's a, um, an iteration count and uh, then the rest of the, the data stored out on rows by processes. So we decompose these, these number of rows over each process. So here's what parallel net CDF code looks like. Uh, of note, uh, it's a lot like MPI file open. We pass in a communicator and a name, uh, but we also maintain a lot of the serial net CDF flavor too, with this idea of a, a net CDF identifier uh, and an access mode. Um, I won't I won't talk too much about this. The, hmm. Here's where things get a little bit confusing. A few years back, the serial NetCDF guys added parallel I.O. support. So we have Argon Northwestern parallel NetCDF, and then we have parallel UCARD NetCDF. Um, they're pretty different things because the UCARD guys get parallel I.O. through HDF5. Uh, but uh, so just be aware of that if you're in if people talking about um, parallel access to NetCDF five file, to NetCDF files, you can do it two different ways. In our way, you know, we're going to use this NCMPI prefix. That's uh, that's kind of our, our namespace. Um, but a lot of the the concepts and the ideas are the same in, in both approaches. Uh, here. Um, Here's a, okay, so here's an I.O. call in, in parallel net CDF. Uh, again, our, our namespace, the NCMPI, uh, whether we are reading or writing the variable, with a, that's the, the put part there, and then var a is the, probably the most common way of accessing these variables, subarray access. And then we make it explicit that we're doing collective I.O. with underscore all. We give a start and a count, that's kind of the, um, we already know the shape of the array because we described it in an earlier step we didn't talk about here. And then we talk about the, the subarray part with the start and account that we actually want to look at. And then this <clears throat> buff count data type tuple describes the memory that we're working with. You can also use a flexible mode interface. So this is the flexible interface where we can use MPI data types to describe anything we're, we're accessing. Most users of parallel net CDF will just pass uh, NC int as a, a basic data type or NC double. But it, it's a little more flexibility if you can describe uh, memory structure. So what does this look like in source code? Uh, we're now wrapping up that file. Um, we do the same thing. We create a, a memory data type like we were before. And now we're going to write that chunk of memory that we created out to memory, out to the file with this, this start and count that we define uh, up here. Uh, and then here uh, is the, here, I'm working kind of backwards here. I'll start from the top. When we're working with NetCDF, we describe dimensions, and these dimensions have names. Then we, when then we collect those dimensions into variables. Those variables also have names. And then we can optionally put attributes on those variables. In this case, we're not putting anything, we're not using NC global, that's the uh, overall data set, that ain't, not any particular uh, variable or dimension. Um, then, NDEF is important. Uh, the reason why parallel net CDF can do some of these fast path optimizations is that there's this bimodal uh, interface. You describe what you're going to do when you write a data set, and then you do it. And that at first seems a little onerous because you sort of want the flexibility of being able to write as, as you go. But again, by paying this price up front, you then told the library, look, make room for 17 variables. They're going to be of this shape and this size. And at that point, the library can then compute the offset of any element of any uh, variable. It doesn't need to worry about coordinating with anybody else. It doesn't need to worry about uh, um, changes in the metadata format. Uh, things just uh, go right into I.O. mode. And so uh, if you can be, if you're okay with this restriction, then uh, you, you get better performance. In HDF5, the trade-offs are a little bit different. HDF5 is more flexible. But that flexibility comes with a small cost. As you write data into HDF5, you must update the metadata and update the structures. And so the HDF5 folks have been working on ways to mitigate that. Uh, but the people who use HDF5 really want that flexibility, so you know that's the trade-off. Uh, so restarting, 
Yeah, I mean, we're right, restarting. We're, we need to look at the file. Um, we need to um, part, get the data into memory and, and, and do something some with it. Uh, hmm. There's no, I, think that, I thought there should be another slide here, but that's okay. Uh, it's not so different. We read the file in with a, we use a communicator. Um, we have a file name. This looks just like the write mode, except we're using, we're open. It's just like creating a data set, except, except instead of creating the file, we're opening the file. No big deal. Now you op you've opened the file. You have this uh, database, so, so to speak, of, 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 of values. How do you make sense of it? Well, again, these, these libraries, both HDF5 and, and Parallel CDF, provide uh, inquiry, inquiry, inquiry functions where we can just figure out what's going on inside the file programmatically. And we can, and I'll show you some of this in a little while, we can, knowing nothing about the file, uh, figure out, uh, in this case, uh, what is the size of, the, of this dimension? What, uh, how big is the column dim size dimension? We'll, we'll, st we'll store it there. And so, remember, in the previous code slide, we opened the file, and now we're gonna go through and, and, and query everything. Because we're opening the file, we're not modifying it, there's no define mode or data mode switching here. The file is gonna stay uh, with the same layout as always had. We're just gonna be uh, parsing uh, and inquiring about the different uh, things. So, okay. In this case, we're simplifying things a little bit. We're using what's called a convention, and this is not uncommon in these co codes. You can start from knowing nothing at all. You can, you can get a full list of what's in the file and then start working through everything, and what are you called, and how big are you? We're gonna cut up a few steps here and just say, okay, this checkpoint file has a variable called matrix. I just know that because that's the convention we're following. And if you don't find that, then you must not be looking at a checkpoint file, so we're gonna error out on that case. Uh, and so you, you get a, this var ID. Everything in NetCDF land is done on these small identifiers. And then with that, with that identifier, you can then figure out the um, dimensions that are associated with that variable. Is this a 2D, a 4D variable? Um, again, because we are following this convention, we know it's gonna be two dimensions, so we don't have to worry about figuring out all that stuff, so we'll just shortcut that. Uh, store it in this array of dimensions, and then we'll go through the dimensions and figure out um, how big is this column, and how big is the row. Um, Again, again, just like the um, MPIO example, we, we do an all reduce to make sure that everyone's okay. There's really no reason it wouldn't be because uh, otherwise you have, a, you have a, because of the way the parallel NCF file is read in, uh, there's no way this would be different, but it's okay to double check, that's fine. Uh, and now finally we'll do the a collective read after we figure out where um, this particular process should start off in the file. You know, so remember, uh, this var ID we're dealing with is the um, overall global matrix of the, of the game of life state, and we're gonna find a particular starting offset, and we're gonna read a particular amount of data into our temporary buffer. And then we just assign our read buffer into this uh, matrix state. So you know, kind of classic uh, conversion of, of 1D C, or C data into a 2D data structure. So, uh, you know, the nice thing about parallel net CDF when you're reading and writing these values is that you're thinking about doubles in an array and you're not thinking so much about bytes in a file. In this example, the matching between the way the game of life thinks about things and the way that the, the parallel net CDF library models data is very similar. They're both dealing with multidimensional arrays, in this case a 2D array, and maybe we want to uh, describe that with a little more um, annotations. And uh, there'll be some optimizations happening for free because uh, we're, MPIO optimizations happen. There are very few, I don't think there are any optimizations in parallel net CF itself other than caching the header. Uh, MPIO, uh, MPIO does all the work for parallel net CDF. I can't think, I don't think there's any. There are some APIs that you can use in parallel net CDF that might do a little caching for you, but. Uh, by and large, uh, all the work we do is just describing uh, MPIO things and then have it do all the work. So that's sort of the quick view of, of what parallel CDF looks like for an application. 
I'll spend a little more time talking about Parallel CF itself, uh, because it's useful not just in game of life simulations, but useful in a lot of other application domains. Can you say again the difference between, like you have NC MPI and I have NF MPI, that's the, so is there a reason for me to look into the other one if I have one, is, the, is one better? No, no uh, they're very similar. Um, let me get to that in the next couple slides because that's talking about the different, um, the question was, I talked about the NC MPI namespace and that is, that's true, that is our namespace for the C interface, but we also have Fortran interfaces, and that's the NF MPI version. Oh, okay, so that has nothing to do with Still parallel at CDF, uh, still using the parallel CDF library, it's just um, the Fortran calls have an NF in them instead of an NC. But I still, they're still two different. I think we need HDF5 to build our Nets, PNET CDF. Uh, no, if, you, if, you're using, if you're using Argon and Northwestern's parallel net CDF, you don't need any HDF5. If you're using Unicar, if you're using the other one, then that would be uh, NF get var, NF put var. Yeah. Okay. If there's no M yeah, MPI means it's, it's us and nothing. No, there's MPI. In okay. All right. Well. Okay. Looks like we got some hands-on exercising to do. Okay. Great. Uh, so yeah, parallel CDF. I spent a lot of time talking about parallel CDF. I work at Argon. I like parallel CDF. I want to make it very clear, though, that Parallel CF would not be where it is today without uh, Northwestern, our partners at Northwestern. Uh, we host the bug tracker and the mailing list, but Waking and uh, formerly uh, Kwe Bao, who, who left a few years back, have done a lot of work on the code. So uh, it makes us a little bit sad to see, you say, call it Argon's Parallel CDF, but it, it isn't. It's, it's definitely uh, Argon and Northwestern, and really, it's today it's almost all Northwestern doing the work. So um, just bear that in mind. Uh, Waking is still actively, um, probably right now, changing something in Parallel Net CDF to add some new feature of some kind. Um, now here's the part where I talk about some of the problems in, in Parallel Net CDF. Uh, one of them is that we have a very simple file format, but what if you have a sensor out in the plains somewhere collecting temperature data? And you want to record uh, time at you know you want to record temperature at every time step, and you really just want to just record for forever, and you don't really know how many time steps you're going to collect. Well, you can use record variables. Record variables have a problem though that they um, if you have many record variables in your file, they're interleaved, kind of like a, a deck of cards. And the the biggest mistake we made in Parallel Net CDF when we designed it was saying ah record variables are a pain. We'll tell people don't use them, and it won't be a big deal. Well. Turns out we didn't really know anything. Everybody uses record variables, and uh, and yeah, it becomes a big performance headache. You can tune to get it better, but this is the one performance pit pitfall on Parallel Net CDF. If you're getting bad performance out of Parallel Net CDF, it's probably because your record variables are um, causing us uh, some headaches. And, but that's okay. We can figure that out if that's really where you are. Uh, so remember, the non-record variables, these values in blue, they're stored contiguously right up after the header. It's only, only these record variables that have a special unlimited dimension that cause us a bit of a problem. And um, this is sort of the, the, the flexibility versus performance trade-off. You can have a variable that grows without bound. It makes it difficult to do that um, as fast as you possibly could. Uh, we talked, to, you know, again, talking about, to, to really highlight some of these points I made during the code walkthrough, this notion of defined mode versus data mode helps us uh, collect all the, the necessary uh, activity in one step up front, and then uh, we, can, we can broadcast that data to everybody else, make sure everyone's got the same values, and then never need to communicate ever again uh, among processes. The header is then uh, locked into position until you change it or um, with, with an explicit change back into defined mode. We have a small header in parallel net CDF. Uh, again, we were matching the file format given to us by the, 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 unit, the unit data uh, serial net CDF uh, file format. Um, again, and this header, uh, the nice thing about this header is we can, we can pad it out to, to, the, to the block alignment necessary for the file system, uh, but only rank zero needs to worry about that. Rank zero collects the data after define mode, writes out, writes out the header, and then we go on, on to uh, a, a more uh, I.O. with the rest of the processes, more data I.O. Uh, We've seen uh, in the game of life, we've seen how the MPI I.O. example constructs data types and sets file views. We've seen, we've seen how Parallel Net CDF uh, can then 
do that under the hood for us with a more simpler um, put this data at this address in this array. Uh, what's going on is exactly as you saw. Uh, NCMPI put Vera all will then create a file type, do a file set view on each process, and then do a, do a uh, collective write. And uh, if you work on, a, work on a stack, MPIO does optimizations like two-phase collective IO, maybe some data sieving. And if you have a really uh, fancy parallel file system, maybe MPIO has a driver for that to, uh, to do IO the best possible way there. So if you've ever used JumpShot, JumpShot's been kind of a, it's just, it, this is one of my favorite tools for visualizing MPI programs, but it, it, it's, it's really information dense, almost aggressively so, almost meanly so. Uh, however, uh, I still like using it, even though it's, it's no longer actively developed uh, at Argon. How, uh, so here's what's going on. I took a, a jump shot trace a few years back of a simple uh, flash IO checkpoint, uh, writing out some, some data, and I wanted to see what's going on in, in parallel at CDF. So uh, there, are, there are four steps here that are worth pointing out. And this little gray here, this little, this little tiny gray slot, that's independent I.O. from rank zero, where it's writing out the header data. And the header on this data set is, is quite tiny. We don't spend much time there. Then you'll see a bunch of uh, little, little writes. It's hard to see, uh, probably from the back of the room there, but there are 10 or so small variables that are being written. In the flash code, it's, an, it's a, a, a mesh code where it's, uh, writing out adaptive mesh data. So this is things like leaf and parent processes, a bunch of tiny little, little data so that when they read the checkpoint data back in, they can reconstruct the adaptive mesh. After that point happens, uh, the third step is writing out four variables collectively. Now, this is fun because this, this dark blue is an MPI file write at all. You don't need to worry about that. It's, it's, a, it's a collective I.O. write. And there are some processes that take a long time on the I.O. and some processes that don't take any time at all. And the processes that don't take any time at all are, are fast because they just shoveled all their data to the I.O. aggregator. And Phil talked about some of the transformations that happened in MPIO. And here's an example where the process rank 0, 1, uh, 0, 4, and 8 are the ones that are doing I.O. They're going to take a little bit longer time. And the other processes will just kind of wait for them to finish. And then finally, there's a file close. And then we, we go on. Uh, there, there is, this is everything that happens in an MPI, from an MPI sense when parallel net CDF does I.O. There's no uh, message passing, and there's no, uh, there, sorry, there are I.O. routines inside MPIO. Parallel net CDF is not making them. Uh, parallel net CDF is just doing um, a few file calls. Uh, if you were to do the same, a similar trace of HDF5, you'd see a little more updating after each variable because HDF5 has to do some bookkeeping. Now, bookkeeping is not terribly expensive for, for very large data sets, so I don't want that to be a, a dig on HDF5. It's just a description of uh, the trade-offs that the different designs have to do. Uh, one of our more recent op optimizations, uh, it's, it's been around for a little while, uh, but one of the things we could do in parallel at CDF, um, okay, so we can write out individual variables pretty fast, straight called the MPIO. But as we saw here, right, there are several variables in this file. And there are several MPIO calls being made. And uh, OK, the MPIO calls do a good job of collecting small requests into bigger requests. But maybe we can do the same thing at the MPIO level and collect, collect many MPIO calls into a single call. Well, there is this notion of a non-blocking interface um, where we post an operation. We can post a, a I put vara for the purple chunk of data, and then I put Vara for the yellow or golden rod chunk, and then wait for completion. Now, when we say non-blocking, the first thing people think about is, is maybe asynchronous or background I.O. But in this case, it's, it's more like, uh, like an MPI implementation that's posting a bunch of sends and receives, and then uh, waits for completion, and all the work happens at wait. It's possible for an MPI implementation to have strong progress, where that, those sends and receives make progress uh, in the background. But more likely, the, the wait command is where all the, ha all the action happens. Similar thing here. We've posted two variables to this imaginary data set, and we wait for completion, and all of the I.O. happens in one shot. So now if you're writing out your temperature data and your velocity data and your whatever data, uh, you can describe it all. Let's say you have enough memory to do all that, and then shoot it off in one shot, 
that's always a good idea. More, more information, more requests in one shot, it's always better than, than less. And it'll make the MPI optimizations more productive. So uh, I probably should have shown this a little earlier because I was talking about flash so much. But this is an example of a wave front, a shock wave coming through a, a detonation. Uh, so flash is modeling uh, supernovas and, uh, and, and things that blow up. Uh, it scales really well. It's one of the first applications we run on, on supercomputers to, to burn them in and, and prove they work. And, uh, and it's great because these guys are down the street at University of Chicago, so we're, we work with them really closely on all kinds of different areas. Uh, like our Game of Life example, they, want, they also have ghost cells as they're doing nearest neighbor exchanges, but we don't, they don't care about that in the checkpoint data. Um, the checkpoint data is interesting because they, they create two kinds of full checkpoint data for restarting. They also have some subset information called plot files, so they have um, different uh, requests sometimes. Sometimes they want to write every variable, sometimes they only want to plot out uh, temperature over time. Um, but they're always using something like HDF5 or Parallelnet CDF to, uh, to dump out the data they need for, for later analysis. And we, uh, they were running on BlueGene, they were trying to scale, and we thought that it, things would be um, better than they were. We looked at it a little bit and thought, well, you know what? You're writing out these 10 or 27 variables. We have this parallel NCDF optimization that can combine them in a single call. And we're able to take these. Uh, you could do two different ways. Right? You, could, you could describe all that in a single uh, larger net CDF variable. Right? If you have um, you know, five 4D variables, you could make a 5D variable where the fifth dimension is variable identifier and then write your temperature and pressure and, and velocity and phi and all those other factors in one bigger variable. And that, if, if this was just flash, that'd be fine. They could do that, be done, no problem. And they did that, it made a big improvement. But they have a whole ecosystem of, of input data and, and analysis data and, and other collaborators. And if they break the file format, uh, they have to get all those collaborators to update their tools. So instead, we, we keep the same file format, this file format version 10, Clearly, they've broken the file format a few times over the years, but they don't want to do it as often as they can. They want to do it um, for specific reasons. And we wore all these variables out using the, the, the net CDF, the parallel net CDF, non-blocking, right combining optimization. And we're able to, uh, you know, almost double performance. This was, this was done back on, uh, I don't think we did this on Mira, so this must have been done back on Intrepid. And so we're able to, at uh, really large scale, double performance. Um, and for Flash, when we say double performance for the I.O. part, that generally results in, oh, I'm trying to remember how that works. You know, Flash isn't only doing I.O., they're also doing a lot of computation. But if you can double the I.O. performance, then that'll get them back a few more iterations of, of science per checkpoint, a few more iterations of, of two more time steps of, of modeling before their allocation runs out. Uh, so another good example of using Parallel CDF is uh, done in this, in this hack code. Hack is a, a cosmic simulation code. Uh, right, you look up in the sky, we have telescopes, we have, we have sensor data, we have um, digital sky survey data, and we see the universe as it is today, and so how did it get there? Well, we have some theories, and we can't go back in time to the Big Bang, but we can model that time. So you, you start off with a number of particles, and you explode them, and you, you run forward through 13 trillion years, and you look at the sky, and you look at your model, and you see how close you are. And I'm probably vastly oversimplifying this. If anybody actually works on cosmology, sorry. Uh, the, um, the point here is you have, you know, you have some, some uh, tons, some trillion particles that represent star bodies or galaxy, galactic clusters or whatever. And so they're all talking to each other. And, and this, this graph down the bottom is sort of the way the, the science, the code thinks about um, stars, right? We see pretty pictures of stars and, 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 and you know, constellations, and they're just points in, a, in space here for this, this simulation. Uh, to do the particle output, uh, you could just dump it all to a file. But uh, again, you might want to take a little bit of time to think about how you would capture that in parallel net CDF. So, we have a, a table of particles. Well, we have a little bit of description of the experiment. You know, what, how many particles are we dealing with? What, what are we trying to experiment here? What, what's our platform? And then the particles are going to be stored in this giant table. We have a particle ID. Each particle has a position in space, a velocity in space, and this physical quantity called 
fee. I don't, I don't know what that is. But it's something we're recording, so seven different values. And then there's a um, sort of a, a bounding box describing which particles belong to which processes. And, and that's the data we're keeping uh, into, into the file. Uh, so again, parallel, parallel NetCDF isn't a, isn't a particle tracking library. It's a multidimensional uh, I.O. library. But it's, these, these arrays are pretty useful for a bunch of different contexts. The hack guys are funny because they're one of the few C++ codes we deal with on a regular basis. Uh, most people are working, writing on Fortran, but the hack guys are um, always kind of rewriting their code and, and trying to get the best performance out of here. So one thing we have to do in, um, to capture so many particles, I think there's four, four billion particles, is use a, a, different file, a slightly different file format. This NC 64-bit data, we've extended the file format a little bit to handle larger uh, offsets, larger types, and uh, get around some limitations in the classic file format of, of, of uh, serial net CDF. Uh, this 64-bit this data file format used to, is now going to be, in the, just like last week, uh, the, the guys at, at UCAR accepted our changes, Waking's changes. And now that that's, this is now a, a, full, uh, a, a file format that your serial tools can look at too, and not just parallel CDF. Uh, you know, attributes on the file, we describe a little bit about what's going on um, and, and some, some funny information we found out on the experiment. Uh, we have to do a little bit about, um, again, we're defining dimensions. Those dimensions get stuck together into variables and attributes again. N note that every process is calling these calls. Uh, every process is putting attributes on the file. Uh, or, sorry, describing attributes to the NetCDF library. Only one process, rank zero, will actually write the data. But if any process disagrees, um, that can be, be a headache. Uh, if one process puts a, a time step of, of today and another process says the time step is, is today plus three seconds, uh, NetCDF will see that as a, um, you have different processes describing different things, and they'll, they'll say that's a, that's a conflict. I think we've relaxed that a little bit because that ended up getting people a little, uh, catching people up. But often, uh, everybody's describing the data. Everybody knows the kind of experiment we're doing and, and what's going on. So usually that's not a headache. Okay. Uh, again, this is, this is actual real hack code. So we, uh, we are collecting the number of particles. MPI XSCAN has been really useful. That's a good tool to use if you have uh, a variable amount of data in every process. This is a, uh, a scan of all the processes, and, and rank zero gets one piece, and then rank, zero, rank one gets um, rank zero's contribution plus its, plus its contribution, and so on and so forth. So uh, we have a couple of billion particles. They're, they've moved around over the world, over the universe, and they've clumped, and they've, they've, they've gathered over places. So some people will have a few particles, and some processes will have many particles. But MPI, with MPI X scan, we then can compute in this um, my offset uh, variable uh, where we should begin our um, our write. So that um, this this uh, my offset becomes part of the start count, and, and the count is how many particles we have and the dimensions we have. So then, with all that data together, we can collectively write the data. We we know uh, we have um, right. We can collectively write this floating point data out to the file. Now you've seen writing checkpoint, checkpoint or, or writing out state two different ways, the, the like a game of life way or a, a hack I.O. way. Um, and we've touched a little bit about how you would uh, look at this data set and figure out what, what the heck's inside of it. You don't need to have the, 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 the grad student who created this experiment around forever. Uh, the file is self-describing. And what does self-describing mean? Well, self-describing means these routines uh, basically, three steps can get you everything you need to know. So we open the file. Sorry, there's a uh, maybe a hard to read comment up here, but if you uh, go through our quick tutorial, you can see the full version of this code. I just cut out uh, everything that wasn't necessary to fit on on one screen. And so uh, this is what I talked about earlier. We we know nothing about this file. This is a ground truth. Uh, all I know is that it's a, in fact I don't even know if it's a netcdf file. All I don't know is that there's a file in this file system. And I want to figure out what's inside of it. So I open the file. I should probably check for error codes on that, on that open because uh, well, I, cut out the error, I cut out the error handling on all these routines because I wanted to, again, fit on the slide. But NCMPI open will fail if it's not actually a NetCDF file. So again, uh, a communicator, 
uh, some, some flags saying what you're going to do to the file. Uh, no write is a hint to saying you can go ahead and cache the heck out of this thing. Uh, an info parameter in case you want to do some tuning. And you get an identifier. W with that identifier, this NC file identifier, you can then figure out how many dimensions you have, how many variables you have, how many attributes you have, and whether you have any unlimited dimension files. And that's, um, those are all going to be uh, scalar values that you can then use to figure out how, you know, you, okay, so how, how, many dimensions, how many dimensions are described in this data set. I can then allocate an array that can hold the dimensions, and then I can go through all the dimensions and figure out how big they are. In this case, I'm storing the sizes into this array. Then I can go through the variables, and I can figure out uh, which variable, you know, what, what is stored in this variable. Is it an NC float, a double, uh, an integer, and how many dimensions are in this variable? And then uh, of it, you have, sorry, in this var n dims, you have, you know, it's going to be two dimensions, three dimensions, whatever. And th this dim IDs array will then tell you, all right, you have you t well, these two pieces, number of dimensions and, and this identifier array, you can then figure out uh, which dimension you figured out earlier is associated with this variable. And if you print this out, you'll see, okay, I have so many variables with this many dimensions and, and no attributes. You can close the file and go on. So, uh, this is kind of a quick crash course in parallel net CDF. There are some restrictions in what you can do with parallel net CDF, but it's a good sort of first. Uh, and simplest I.O. library you can come across. Uh, some of the pitfalls are this record variable uh, I.O., which is unfortunate. Uh, often people are using record variables because you can make them pretty big, but we relax the file format to have very large variables, and that's been in parallel CDF for a while. And, and like I said, last, last, recently was incorporated into uh, Unidata's code base. So. Uh, that's not going to. That's one one of our few incompatibilities with with Unidata's Night City app that we have uh, converged upon back again finally. And I would say that uh, you know Parallel CDF is is uh, your decision to use Parallel CDF might be domain de domain de domain demanded, um, but you might just play around with it anyway because uh, it's a good first stepping stone towards uh, the more sophisticated I/O libraries like like HDF5. And uh, I think with that, I'm going to, oh yeah, we have a little more. So again, parallel NCDF is just one example. HDF5 is a pretty common one. But there are other I.O. libraries too, because every application is a little bit different. And a lot of these I.O. libraries, I'm not going to go through all of them uh, explicitly. A lot of them build on HDF5. In fact, uh, HDF5 has proven itself to be a pretty good foundation library. So again, the stacks get deeper and deeper, and the abstractions get more and more targeted. So when you're trying to understand what's going on in I.O., you might have to go through several layers to really understand uh, the step here. Uh, of note, probably Adios is worth talking about. That's the most different here. Uh, the motivation for Adios was sort of uh, make, make tuning and, and changing uh, interfaces as easy as possible as a simple XML file. And uh, they get a lot of mileage out of their performance because they're creating this um, log-structured uh, Adios binary packed format that is really efficient to write. So checkpointing I.O. with Adios on Cray systems with Lustre file systems, uh, it's, it's, it's a, it goes whip, whip, whip fast. Uh, there's a rebuilding stage that happens afterwards for reading. But uh, again, most people are doing checkpoint I.O. Uh, at least who are using Adios or just want to get this data written as fast as possible. Um, H5Part is a good example of taking the HDF5 tutorial and just focusing on one particular domain. Uh, we did something similar for the game of life. We took the MPI routines, just talked about writing out these, these arrays. H5 part just tracks particles. The, the routine, the, the library is, I don't know, it's like six routines. Um, so it's boiling down all of HDF5, which is 130 routines, into the six that they needed for their particle, particle accelerating um, simulators. Uh, and then things like PIO are, are interesting because they are a front a application layer that has multiple backends. And so they'll do whatever is best. You know, they're, they're not, they don't care. They'll, they'll work with HDF5, they'll work with, with parallel CDF. Whoever can give them the best performance on this machine. So uh, these I/O libraries um, probably already exist for certain domains. It's at this point it's unlikely that you have to invent one, but you shouldn't feel bad if you do. Just please, please kind of study the literature and see what else is out there before you do invest all that time. So uh, with, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Phil for the, the what, 
I talk, I've given this after the past talk a couple times, uh, and this is always my favorite part of the day, uh, and so I'm going to let Phil do that part. Uh, I hope he uh, enjoys it as much as I do. Thanks, Ron. Thank you.